But I, I wanted to start by just um, taking a chance to introduce our speaker and say just a couple of things. So first, um, just wanted to thank you today for, for coming in and listening um, to uh, Dr. Karen Fingerman. Um, she's one of our uh, nation's leaders on a variety of topics um, related to things like social connectedness and leader life, and she'll tell you a bit more about that. Um, and, and I'll tell you just a little bit more about Karen in, in a minute, but first I wanted to share a little bit of information about the organizations um, who have been involved in helping bring Dr. Fingerman to FSU. Um, so today actually is the, the first talk, our inaugural speaker for our Dempsey Barron Speaker Series, which is supported by the Dempsey Barron Endowment uh, to the Pepper Institute on Aging and Public Policy here at FSU. Um, the, the Pepper Institute is a multidisciplinary hub for aging research and has been around for actually four decades. So we've had uh, the opportunity to bring many fantastic speakers like Karen to campus over the years. Um, Dr. Ann Barrett is our, has been our fearless leader for um, about six years and had the great idea to introduce this new uh, speaker series. But the uh, Dempson Barron Dempsey Barron uh, Endowment, excuse me, supports our ability here at the Pepper Institute to um, advance research on uh, care and quality of life of people with cognitive impairments. Um, but in, in addition to the Pepper Institute, the Institute for Successful Aging is co-sponsoring today's talk. Um, that institute, ISL, is directed by Dr. Neil Charnas. Um, and ISL is another aging institute on campus that supports multidisciplinary research, um, particularly that focused on aging, uh, age-associated disorders, functional and cognitive decline, um, issues related to interventions and dissemination of knowledge to the community, um, and, and also with uh, public leadership around issues related to aging. So, um, so Dr. Fingerman was actually scheduled to give her talk here last April. Um, and we thought, oh, we'll, we'll just delay her talk for a couple of months while we work out this little virus problem. Obviously that was, um, we, we weren't sure how long it would take, but I, I, I can assure you that I was not um, anticipating that we would still be where we are today. Um, so we haven't been able to kind of get things back to normal just yet. Uh, but we are thrilled to have Dr. Fingerman here online and to have the chance to learn about her work uh, today. So hopefully sometime in the future, she can join us at FSU in person. Um, but uh, on that note, let me just give you just a little bit of information about her today um, and introduce her to you before she gets started. Um, so Dr. Karen Fingerman is um, currently Professor of Human Development and Family Sciences at UT Austin. So she studies adult development and aging. Uh, she's also the founding director of the Texas Aging and Longevity Center and the director of research for the UT Austin Center on Aging and Population Sciences. Um, she oversees the graduate portfolio in aging and health at UT Austin. And this last year in 2020, she was awarded the Distinguished Mentor in Gerontology Award, which is a big honor in the biggest um, gerontology um, organization in I think internationally, which is the Gerontological Soci Association of Amer uh, Society of America and in the behavioral and social sciences section. So in terms of her work, Dr. Karen uh, Fingerman has, has published over 175 papers and chapters um, looking at issues like relationships with family members, friends, acquaintances, um, all the way from young adulthood all the way to old age. And um, she particularly focuses on issues related to emotional qualities of ties and social support and exchanges. She directed the NIA funded uh, family exchanges study, which is a longitudinal study um, focused on middle-aged adults and their partners and as well as their children and their parents. And currently, um, Dr. Fingerman oversees the NIA funded daily experiences and well being in late life study, which is focused on the 300 older adult social relationships and physical and cognitive functioning in the daily context. And I believe that's um, some of the data that she'll be drawing from in her talk today. So her talk today, you'll see here, is, the, uh, is titled Implications of Weaker Ties in Later Life. Um, and we're just really thrilled to, to have you here today and so thankful that you've taken the time to join us and, and share your research with us. So with that, I'll just uh, hand the reins over to you. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much, Don. I'm so honored and um, grateful that you've invited me and I'm grateful to the Pepper Center and to the um, Institute for Successful Aging. It's really a wonderful opportunity and I'm really glad to be here uh, with you all remotely um, and to tell you a little bit about some of the things I've been studying. I've been really interested in the implications of the social world for a variety of health outcomes. And one of the reasons for that is that older adults who have stronger ties, who are better social integration, live longer, they're healthier, better psychological well-being, they're better physically. Um, in fact, this is a meta-analysis. It's very, very widely cited in the field of relationship research. It's um, by Holt Lundstedt and colleagues from 2010, and they did a meta-analysis where they looked at mortality, the likelihood that people die based on um, factors such as their relationships, so social support and social integration. This is what I'm going to talk about for much of the rest of this um, symposium is this idea of what is social integration. It accounts for mortality better than cigarettes, um, better than cigarette cessation. I didn't include all of the other ones, but you know, it's the usual suspects on the rest of this list. So obesity, um, all of those things are lesser predictors than these social ties. Now we've known about this kind of a strong association since about the 1970s when Lisa Berkman did one of the first epidemiological studies. And it's been a really perplexing question. Why would this be the case? I mean, we can look at smoking and say, yeah, it causes lung cancer and whatever. Um, much, much harder to get at it through relationships. And that's one of the reasons I've been so interested in it is what is it about these relationships that is contributing to keeping you alive? Well, part of what social integration is, is to network diversity. It's having a mix of close families. You've got your close family, your spouse, your child, your friends, your neighbors. You're involved in group activities. You're involved in going to church, temple, mosque. And these things have been shown to link to better health and to better cognitive functioning, which I will show you later in the talk. I am not someone who studies cognitive functioning, so it's you know a little intimidating for me to talk about that with y'all who do study it. But I'll you know sort of hint at what I've got, and you can um, you can join in and tell me if I'm on the right track or not. But I have been really interested in the mental and physical health outcomes. So just to show you, for example, one study that would be the kind of thing that people have looked at. Um, Howard Litvin and Kate Fiore um, have both done a line of research on what they call network typologies. So they ask people about a variety of different social partners and social activities, and they put together these sort of um, categories of what kind of a network you have. So this diverse network is this idea of social integration. You've got family, you've got friends, you've got neighbors, you're running around with all your activities. Friend network is only a little bit different in that you don't have quite as much on the way of all that activities and groups and you know, um, you're just friends, family, etc. Neighbors have very few, the neighbor network is people who are, um, you probably know more of them right now during COVID where they're not as connected to their family or friends, but the neighbors will look in on them and such. Family is restricted to just family members. This community clan is kind of interesting. I won't talk about it too much because they're a very small group, but they're similar to the diverse actually. And the restricted is what you'd think it would be. There's someone who has maybe a grown child still alive on the other side of the country. So when you just look at it this way, this is no longer just a, do you have more, do you have less? It's a, what kind of a constellation do you have? It predicts the mortality as well. So these people in this restricted network, it's not that these are totally isolated. They didn't find enough who are completely isolated to say, okay, isolated network. They still have someone, but it's not enough. Their rate of mortality is double that of the people who have that diverse group. And I should add these studies um, control for things like the fact that you're going to withdraw possibly from your social network as you're dying. So a lot of the work is longitudinal and it is looking at that kind of um, temporal aspect to it. What's interesting here that I, I should mention is that family doesn't do it for you. Take a look at this, this family group has a very high rate of mortality compared to even the people who are in, in friend and family and diverse. So just having your family is not enough. It's gotta be the combination. And these people, like I said, often have a grown child. Um, so we're talking about something, some kind of enhanced benefit from having a greater variety of social ties. There's a lot of research on the implications of family in late life. Family caregiving, family helps you, provi provides you support. Family helps buffer against stress right now. You know, maybe you talk to, if you have a spouse, it's great. If you have uh, people who you can, in your family, you can depend on, they matter. But 
they've gotten a lot of research. What we don't know is what's going on that makes these networks superior, if you will, for well-being. Well, one of the aspects of these is that they include weak ties. So your family and friends are your close ties. That's where most of the research has been done. We know that close ties are very important in old age. And in fact, um, Laura Karstensen has a theory, socio-emotional selectivity theory, that is focused you know, really on that role of close ties and their importance. And I'm in no way saying they're not important, but there is added benefit from these weaker ties. Let's pause for a moment and say, what on earth is a weak tie? Well, interestingly, the very first study of weak ties, the guy who coined the phrase was Mark Granovetter. He did this study in the early 1970s. And what he did is um, he set out to understand how people get jobs. That's what he wanted to know was how do you get a job? And at the time, it's not that he really thought I'm gonna find out something about weak ties. Really the kind of intuitive guess was that it would be through, you know, family and very close contacts that there would be a degree to which, you know, maybe your father-in-law appoints you as the, you know, director of the commission on uh, COVID-19 because they happen to have the ability to do that. So that was kind of the expectation, but that wasn't what he found. What he found was the weak ties. He didn't find the nepotism as the key driver. Rather, it was people who you knew a little bit who knew other people who could help you get the job. And that makes sense to us now when you think about it. That's the whole phrase, networking, right? You know someone who knows someone who knows someone. It's the whole principle behind LinkedIn. Mark Granovetter was the guy who invented LinkedIn only you know, in a research tool and he coined the term weak ties. I've drawn on that literature to go beyond weak ties to what I call um, consequential strangers. And I wrote a book with a journalist and it got translated to Korean and Chinese. So, you know, this was, anyways, um, this was a popular book, but the basic idea, which I've also written about is that it's not just the weak ties, which have a certain um, valence and recognizability, but that there are relationships that um, make up our daily life. And you might not even list these people and yet they are important to how you go about your day. And they do, um, these are the kinds of people. So it could be a coworker or a neighbor or service provider. In an academic setting, probably your mentors and mentees, some of them have progressed to be like true friendships and such, but a lot of them are still something else. They're this, community groups, church and mosque. Now these had been researched in social integration work, research, but this has not been researched as much. People in familiar settings. So you might be noticing this during COVID. I still do a Zoom um, exercise class. And it's like all these people who for the past few years like have shown up on Wednesday morning and they're still there on Zoom. I don't see them any other time. I don't really know them. I don't have their cell phone numbers, but I really like the fact that when I go like on Wednesday at nine, it's all the same people, you know, sweating and running around their own little rooms. But um, same thing with connections via close ties. So for example, I always have, a certain holiday with a close friend and her sister-in-law's at that holiday dinner. I don't see that sister-in-law ever otherwise, but I always like it and I like seeing her kids grow up and there's a connection there. And the same with your very distant relatives. Now those um, categories of relationships have not been well researched and yet they seem to be important when you look at the way we assess things and who lives longer. It's the people who are having more of that kind of contact. Oh, I added in social media contacts here. I have not looked at these so much because um, there's a limited group still in late life um, who have such contacts. And, and there's, there's a whole literature on that that I won't, I won't go into. So mostly I won't be talking about that today. What do they do and why would you need both? Well, there's a theory, functionalist theory of relationships. And the idea behind that is that different kinds of relationship serve different functions. So again, this goes back a ways. And one of the original studies was um, this very, very like stereotypically 1950s view of the world where this um, Weiss did this study where he showed that people who were in a group called um, parents without partners, and they were all widowed because this was done like, you know, in the 1950s, I think. And they discovered that that group couldn't substitute for the loss of a spouse. Even though they got together regularly and things, nothing could replace the spouse. And so the argument was that the close ties give you attachment. They give you a sense of true belonging. They are the social support. And that, um, again, from family caregiving, um, you've either got a paid provider or you've got your very closest family members bathing you in things. And they're also a source of positive and ne negative emotion that is um, really part of that whole close intimacy. 
and you're not going to be able to replace that with a book club. Um, so that was that idea in functionalist theory. But there are also things that the weak ties do that the close ties cannot do. One of those things is what sociologists call social capital. And the idea behind that is very much that Granovetter idea that, wait a minute, if you know people who know people. So right now, for example, in Austin, if you know somebody who knows how to get on a list for the vaccine, that's how you get the vaccine, which is a little bit crazy, but there's a degree of social capital. Weak ties are the ones connecting people to uh, various health, uh, health suppliers. Weak ties also give you stimulation and novelty. So it's one of the things that um, your close contacts know the same things you do more or less. And by the time you get to late life, you've done a lot of these things together. If you wanna do something completely different, it's from someone you don't know as well. They've been somewhere or done something or, or bring you some new experience. Um, now, by the same token, as much as they are novelty, they're the familiarity in an outside setting. So um, when I came here today to give my talk, it was so great that Don and I had a chance to get to know each other a few weeks ago. We spent like an hour chatting and it just gives me this familiarity when I came here that she was already here and it made me feel more familiar, more grounded. And we get that in a lot of different ways from our weak ties. It's the barista at your local coffee shop who just remembers what you like for coffee. The other interesting things they can do is forming a connection to your personal past. And that is, um, I'm gonna show you in a minute what that's about, but that's like your college roommate who you very rarely see. So it'd be very hard to argue that they have a role in your network. You haven't spoken to them in a year and a half and yet they have a very strong meaning to you psychologically, that weak tie. And then they may provide a pattern to your daily life. And that's much more so when we're all out in the work world, you know, from, they're just people you see that patterns your day, um, either through yourself or through your children or other people's um, schedules. Well, this brings me to a study I wanna tell you about. I've been talking about older studies and I'm gonna talk about one of mine, one of my first ones, and it's really an oldie, but a goodie. Um, I did it in the 1990s, and it's a study of holiday cards. And so for those of you that are, you know, born after maybe 1990, I'm going to tell you a little history here. Back in the 20th century, at the holiday season, we used to send holiday cards. Now, these were not just something that we printed on our computer. We went and we bought a literal card, like from Hallmark, and it was on paper. And then we wrote a little note inside to the person we were sending it to and we put it in an envelope and we put a stamp on it and we walked through the snow because we all had snow even in Florida you probably had snow in the 90s and we'd walk through the snow to one of those blue boxes that you see around town called a mailbox and we'd mail it and so that's kind of the thing that would happen and so we were really interested in why people were doing this because even at the time it seemed a little bit like why are people doing this um, and what are they getting out of it so we um, managed to convince a bunch of people to fill out a survey. They first gave us background information. We got their well-being. We got um, we got them to do, we developed a measure of how important are holiday cards to you, how nostalgic are you. So we just kind of had a sense of what the ritual meant. And then for every card they received, they filled out a survey for us, and they either gave us the card or they made a photocopy of it, so we could actually text analyze what they received and what um, who it was from. And what we found was that surprisingly, there really um, wasn't that much difference uh, between young and old in sending cards to people they'd never been close to. Middle-aged adults do it somewhat more and that's partly because they're out in the work world. So um, for example, you know, I get a card from the college every year. I've never actually been close to the person in the college who sends it, but I'm working right now and that's one I would send, maybe send or get. Um, interestingly, the older adults receive cards from people they were never close to at the same rate as midlife. And the reason this is interesting is I mentioned earlier, Laura Karstensen's theory is that as you get older, you invest much more in your close partners. These not close partners are not as important to you. And yet at the holiday season, when people are really busy at a time of year that has a lot of emotion involved, older adults are still involved with these people in sending these cards back and forth. We had them do a survey about the meaning of the cards. And again, what was interesting um, in certain ways is that emotion was not any higher for the older adults than the younger adults, which it should have been theoretically as well. The link to one's personal past was higher. It's not all the cards, but this is where we see an age difference. And particularly, I should add, these are particularly for the um, 
not close cards. These analyses per pertain primarily to the people you were never close to. So you're still getting some emotion and sentimental meaning from it. The link to the personal past is very interesting because one of the participants told me um, in a like note in her survey, open-ended anything else you wanna tell us, she said, you know, my husband's college roommate sent us cards every year. And finally I wrote him back and said, you know, after a few years, he did it after Charlie died. And I finally wrote him back and said, you know, Charlie died a few years ago. And what's interesting is that the exchange still meant something, even in the absence of that person being alive. There's this link that somehow is maintained at a time of year when the ritual matters, keeping the relationship going. And sometimes a holiday greeting is just a holiday greeting. But the important thing from here is that these connections to people, these connections that only occur once a year that are really weak mattered. So we looked at social embeddedness, which is sort of the opposite of loneliness, if you will. It's kind of the scale with the positive valence, how connected do you feel to people, how, you know, and so forth. Um, and that is predicted by having more cards from your weak ties. Just getting those tangible artifacts in old age made people feel more connected. So there was something going on here. This was kind of the start of where I became interested in weak ties. It brings us forward 20 years to the daily experiences and well-being study. And I'm going to talk about that study uh, for the rest of this talk. And um, what we did in this study, the, the participants are all in the Austin, Texas area. We had 333 adults over age 65 who completed an initial two hour um, base interview. And it included things like um, dananometer, grip strength, and cognitive assessments that I'll talk about, and um, well being measures and social ties. We got a lot of information about their social involvement. After we did that, we put a number of devices on them. And, um, you know, I do have to say that your group has the, you know, top technology and aging people in the world. So, you I know, you, you have Walter Boot and Neil Charnas and some others. So what I'm doing is probably pretty basic compared to a lot of what um, they could tell you about, but I'll, I'll tell you what I did with it with the social world. And we got 313 people who completed all of the data that I'll show you. There's quite a bit of equipment involved. And primarily it was equipment failures that we um, account for people who didn't complete. We had a relatively um, old sample and they were in reasonable health, but full range from poor to excellent. This is a little bit, um, I mean, obviously they're highly educated. Over half of them have an, uh, a college degree, but what you need to know is that 45% of adults over 65 in Austin have a college degree. So yes, it's elevated and elevated relative to the population, but the population of Austin is very well educated. Um, and a, about a third of them were either African-American or um, Hispanic. Okay, so these social involvement measures. I'm gonna tell you about a couple of them. One of them is the Cohen social integration measure. And that social integration is what we talked about earlier. The way this is measured is they ask you in the past two weeks, you know, how much have you been involved with your siblings, with friends, with coworkers? They ask about these different kinds of roles you could be in to be connected to other people in the past two weeks. And more involvement is more social integration. And that seems like a very crude measure. It is a little bit of a crude measure, but it's incredible. Um, first of all, it's better than the epidemiological studies, which just rely on things like, are you married and do you have children? Um, this at least asks about contact and quality of contact and things. But the other thing is that if you don't know Sheldon Cohen, he's at Carnegie Mellon and he has done just some really creative, interesting things. So he, way back when, I mean, again, this probably goes back to the 90s, he did this study where he took his little measure and then he got a bunch of college students to agree to be infected with the rhinovirus. And they stayed in hotels, uh, socially distanced, even before it was a thing, they were each in their own hotel room far apart. And they did things like measured the um, excretions into the tissues. Like, like they, every tissue they used, they put in a little bin and they measured you know, reaction to the rhinovirus. And they found that the people who had more of these kinds of contacts had better immune functioning. And he actually had a piece, I think, in American Psychologist in the past year on um, the effects of social integration on um, upper respiratory in the COVID-19. So he's, a, he's really well known um, for that kind of work. And we, um, we used his measure. 
We also use Tony Antonucci's convoy measure. And this is a, a really interesting way to diagram close ties. And so this is you in the middle, in the innermost circle go people who are so close to you, it's hard to imagine life without them. The middle circle is people who are not so close, but who are still very important. And the outer circle are people you have not mentioned, but, but who are close enough and important enough to be in the circles. Please name people who are close and important to you, not people you happen to know or be related to. And this measure has been used all over the world because it's so easy to translate and it's easy for people to do, it's not dependent on verbal skills. Um, an interviewer usually distributes it, but still it um, widely, widely used. So we knew who their close social ties are and how they're, then you follow up with how are they related to you? How close do you feel? How long have you known them? What's their gender? You can get all kinds of information, but you get it from the map. We did do some things with well-being, depression, loneliness, life satisfaction. We had a cognitive battery. Um, it's pretty impoverished compared to what I'm sure you would, um, many of you would want to do. We did have a cognitive psychologist who gave us the suggestions of what to include given that we had very limited time. Um, and like I said, we have, we have a, a bit of a measure of physical health as well there. So I want to talk to you about what we found and how do weak ties play out in everyday life? Well, we gathered some more information about that. What we did is we did something called an ecological momentary assessment. And what those are, they're the little brief surveys that pop up on a handheld device, like on your iPhone. And we took that convoy information. So we know who the close partners are. We know their names and things. And we transferred it onto an Android device that the um, study provided. And every three hours, they told us who they'd been in contact with, along with up to six additional people. So these are not people you named as close. And we got more information about them. How are they related to you, gender, a few things. The little short surveys had to be timed to five minutes, but we still got um, information, including, did you see them in phone, in person, and so on. So every three hours, who have you, who have you seen in person? Um, well, every three hours you get the 10 people. Did you see your spouse? Did you, you know, did you have contact with your spouse, with your daughter, whoever you had listed in the 10? And then if you said yes, you know, how you did it. We also do know if they were in a group or they were alone. I'm not going to talk about that, but just to sort of give you a feel for those data. We gave a lot of training to people to use that Android device. We provided it so it was always the same device so that we could have someone um, troubleshoot with them and be looking at the exact same device while they're on the you know, phone explaining the device if they needed to. Um, because they were all in Austin, interviewers could go back to their home. They generally didn't need to because we did provide training. Um, so yeah, we, we also took it offline, um, which with older adults is something I would recommend because updates are not your friend. And you will discover that your phone updates more than you possibly imagine when you are out in the field and it's updating on your participants. So it was offline while they were using it. Every three hours, they also reported on um, 14 different sets of activities. We, we developed those um, from like American time use survey and things like that of things people were doing. And we assessed their mood. Um, how much did they feel calm, love, content, proud? And how much did they feel negative emotions every three hours? We also put um, Actical-Z um, um, accelerometers on them. And what that does is it's a, it's a wrist mounted thing. It's a little bit like my Fitbit, but it's much more precise. It's a much, much better measure of um, activity and sedentary assessment. So um, we put those on with a hospital band. They're, um, they're just, it, it's like if your Fitbit actually got it right, that's what it would be. Because I know like my, mine doesn't always count all of the exercise I think it should, but it does on the Actical. Our Android devices also had electronically activated recorders. Now these are, these are actually an app now that you put on there and they're very, very widely used um, now in the literature. There've been hundreds of studies with this. And what it does is it records 30 seconds out of every seven minutes. And so it captures conversations and television exposure. And we managed to generate 153,000 sound files from our 300 participants over the five to six days of intensive data. We transcribed it all. Um, 
I'll show you a little bit more about it later, but it's it's a nice device because it's not as intrusive as having somebody wear it continuously. So you're pulling out little fragments of conversation, but they still allow for analysis of language and emotion um, without being overly invasive. So we have a lot of information about these people. Our first prediction was that encounters with weak ties throughout the day might lead to increased activity. Now keep in mind that the literature up until now had looked at social integration as things like Cohen's in the past two weeks, how much have you seen these people? And then it had associated it with outcomes. But the question is, well, did that happen when you were with them? If you report that your people report that they're happier who also said that they had more contact with a lot of different people, Yes, it's compelling that the meta-analysis showed that helped people live longer. I mean, it's been found hundreds and hundreds of times in different populations, but it still doesn't even begin to get at the question of, yeah, but did those two things co-occur? And so we wanted to look at that. And what we did is we looked at the people they encountered in the prior three hours, their diverse behaviors, those activity checklists, and then their physical activity and their sedentary time. And the reason this is important too is that all of these epidemiological studies have looked at social integration, mortality, well being. A lot of the research that followed, and there are thousands of studies, have looked at psychological occurrences in relationships. So, feeling supported, buffering stress, even behaviors, you know, they get you to go to the doctor and convince you. Those things are all really important and they're all clearly part of the reason people live longer, but no one had looked at the more direct effect that you have to get up out of your chair to go and be with a weak social partner. I mean, sedentary kills people and older adults are pretty sedentary. So just that difference between having to get up and do something with someone might make a difference. And when we looked, um, oh, I'll just, tell you briefly, this is um, just the distributions of the behaviors and the percent of time being sedentary. Um, the physical activity counts from the ACTICAL are these um, activity um, expenditure equations, and they're, they're not very meaningful as numbers. So I didn't put it up here, but it's basically the idea here, the percent sedentary is pretty clear. Older adults are pretty sedentary as were our participants. And this is just a continuous measure of activity is the way to think of it. Um, but you know, three quarters of the time they had an encounter with a spouse or close partner, and about half the time they had a weak tie, and about 20% of the time they had no encounters with anyone. Okay, well, what we found is that the diversity of behaviors was predicted by both the close ties and the weak ties, but physical activity was only predicted by the weak ties. That is that when people were with a neighbor or with a um, book club member or someone like that, they were more physically active and less sedentary. So very much in the direction of the prediction. But you might be wondering, okay, so you had these more diverse social encounters. You saw a bunch of you know, not close people. It predicted more activity. Okay, great, that's what she predicted. But did the more activity predict the more diverse social encounters. This is a possibility. And thank you, reviewer three, for telling us to look at it because in fact, it was true. This happened as well. Now, this was not in our theory and we were trying to figure it out. I mean, why would more activity predict more diverse social encounters? That's the opposite of the whole social integration theory. And I told you they've been trying to look longitudinally because you know the theory is that, hey, you have all this engagement it predicts you're staying well, not that, oh, well, you withdrew as you were getting ill. And this would almost look like, you know, you withdrew as you were getting less active. But that's not how it actually works. We diagrammed the day for an average participant. And I'll walk you through this a little. This social integration is how many different types of social partners people were with. And you can see, not surprisingly, that from about 10 a.m. to 4, they have a lot more different people they're seeing. This is their diverse behaviors, this green line. And what we're seeing here is, um, it's actually from about here. Remember that these are three hour intervals. So we don't have an interval starting at 3 p.m. But from what we know from other literature and participants from about 3 p.m. to seven is the most active time of the day for most people. 
People are the least sedentary. This is the proportion of time sedentary. And these are the ActiCal data. So what you see here is exactly what I just diagrammed. So people, when they are with more different social partners, it predicts more activity, right? At the same time, right? This is more active than this, concurrent. But it looks like this activity predicts being engaged with a lot of partners. And in fact, it's gone down a little here. What we think is happening is, let's just imagine that you met a bunch of friends at the park to go for a walk because you're socially distancing and it feels safe and you're all wearing masks. And you start out really walking along and then you slow down a little and you stop and look at the views. It's, it's that you can't sustain this energy for all that period of time. You're still seeing increased activity. And I'm really viewing this as concurrent and not causal. So in the moment, it looks like these things co-occur together. Um, but nonetheless, it does add another element to our understanding of weak ties and how they function. They have a direct physical correlate. You're moving. So encounters with weak social ties are associated with a greater diversity of behaviors or activities, more physical activity, and fewer sedentary periods. I want to tell you a little bit about the air data now. This is a diagram of an average participant. We took someone right in the middle of our sample from 9, um, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. So this is tracking their acoustic exposures. And I had a student who did this visualization. And what this brown is, is this is um, sort of watching television, which is a huge chunk of the day. Older adults, it's their, still their number one leisure activity. They spend five to six hours a day watching television. And these are engaged in stimulating conversations, which also occur. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about both the TV viewing and the conversations. Um, I mentioned that we had 158,000 sound files, only 80% of them had sound, and that's the one we looked at. We ended up with 268 of those in the analyses I'm going to show you. And that has to do with matching people up across devices and things. Um, I wanted to mention, because I, I know Don told me you're interested in cognition. And I did want to mention to you that cognition and social integration have a very long history. So in the 1960s, this guy named Bennett um, sort of introduced the idea that he called it an enriched environment. If you had 10 or more litter mate rats raised together, versus rats raised in isolation. And the enriched environment got not only 10 litter mates, they got a whole bunch of little toys. It was like a little fraternity party for rats. Um, and they had more cortical matter and their brains were bigger and all that stuff. So it's just kind of goes back a long way that um, you know scholars have thought about this. Um, there's a lot of longitudinal data that have tried to disentangle the directionality of the effects between social engagement and cognition. And I just listed a few here. It looks like, um, it looks like the social world affects cognition broadly across domains. The different studies find different associations. And it's primarily how did you measure the social world and how did you assess cognition? So um, we had a, hand, a chapter in the Handbook of Cognitive Aging where we kind of argued that it does seem like, you know, what I've been talking about, there's stimulation, there's novelty, there's movement, there's things that go on when you're actively engaged in the social world that are good for different aspects of cognition. Um, Steve Zaret helped us write that handbook chapter and we, he thought it was very inconclusive for dementias and we, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go there because my data are all people who um, are relatively cognitively intact who could be in our studies. So let me just show you a little from the year data. Now I should mention, we, um, I really put this together just knowing you were interested in cognition and so it's really like, you know, you've run your clothes through the washer and you don't know if they're gonna shrink in the dryer or whatever. These are not, or I don't know, I guess I could say I made the batter and I haven't baked the cake. This is not a fully baked um, uh, study. This is just, I wanted to see if we had something and I was pretty excited because we do sort of have something. What happened is that um, we looked at the, okay, so we have all of these snippets, 30 seconds out of seven minutes, 30 seconds out of seven minutes, 30 seconds out of seven minutes. And what we looked at is what percentage of those have speech on them. And so every three hours, we know who you were with. Were you with your spouse? Were you with acquaintances? Who were you with? Well, when you're with close ties, about 20, 
three out of 100 of those snippets, you talked. It's higher when you're with weak ties. Now, granted, those are not big differences. We've got thousands of files. So yeah, it's significant. But at least we know that it went in the direction of what we thought would happen. And that's even more so when we look at word count. How many words did they have each time they spoke? And it's kind of like today, I, I actually don't talk this fast when I'm with my family. I'm always going to be a fast talker, but I, I talk really fast with weak ties because there's an energy or an excitement and I'm pretty typical um, in terms of doing that. And so those were kind of interesting to us. But I think a more interesting thing is our most recent analysis. So we, Jamie Pennybaker um, is a social psychologist who started the EAR um, app way back in the olden days when it was a uh, like audio recorder. And he has software, the Linguistic Inquisition and Word Count software. And it's really well set up. It's very easy. This is, you know, um, there's much more sophisticated ways to analyze language. But for someone like me, this is really user-friendly way to do it. And prepositions, adverbs, and what he calls cognitive processes. So Jamie's put together what he calls a dictionary. And the cognitive processes are things like because and hence, always, never, hasn't, but, else. These are things that show a level of cognitive complexity beyond just nouns and verbs. And so, um, so when we looked at that, yeah, people do these things more with their weak ties. And so again, it's not huge, but it's there. And we have begun to model it. And it looks like this effect is maintained, controlling for things that you think would matter, age, gender, and so forth. So it looks like the presence of weak ties is associated with differences in the way that people are speaking, which is, of course, in and of itself, some, something of an indicator of cognitive functioning. So again, I, I just wanted to give you something I thought would really maybe interest this crowd, but um, it's one of those stay tuned findings. And if you have thoughts about what I should look at, let me know. Okay, so this is a little bit um, a little bit farther along in our analyses. We looked at TV watching. We have that both self-reported from those little surveys, the EMA, and from the ear. We coded it 99% accuracy. Um, people, you know, our, our listeners were able to figure it out. And again, what's interesting here is that weak ties, once again, are associated with the better outcome. Watching less TV is better. And when you're with weak ties, it's rare in late life that you're still watching TV. You're more likely to do that either when you're alone or you're with your spouse or your grandchild or such. So the weak ties, again, they get you out of the house, they get you away from the TV. Summary is that close and weak ties involve conversation. Older adults use more conversation and more complex language with weak ties in certain ways. I don't want to overstate that. And they also watch more TV with close partners, which may be part of the reason they don't talk as much as they've got the TV on. I have just a couple of minutes to cover this study. Um, what we did is we followed up our, our dues participants during COVID-19 in May and June. We got them all to do a, a brief survey and we were interested in looking at whether they were living alone because it was such a um, context for looking at social isolation and who could be compensating for family if you didn't have one in-house. So they're now almost 70 and uh, we got 226 of them uh, to do it, which given that we had about th just over 300 and there were deaths and cognitive impairments and such, it was a pandemic. We were pretty pleased with that response rate. We had them report on the prior 24 hours. Um, it's called a day reconstruction method, but we, we did just a brief sort of survey of what happened from the time they woke to noon, from noon to five and from five to bed. So it's, 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 not, a, um, it's not the rich data that we had from the first wave. I'm gonna talk about the afternoon for you, although the findings are the same, it, it's just that this time period has more of it. So I'll show you what we found there. Well, when we looked at positive emotions, people who lived alone responded more to in-person contact. So if they managed to see someone on their porch or wherever masked, these people were all maintaining social distancing for the most part. I think like 6% of them weren't, but everyone else was staying at home and really, so if they saw someone in person, it improved their mood. No effect if you're living with someone else, presumably because you know they're around, especially right now, all the time. Phone contact had this 
opposite effect. It increased negative emotion and particularly loneliness. So this is kind of perplexing because we'd certainly like to be able to tell people, to call old people, help them not be lonely, call them. And that wasn't, um, that wasn't what we found here, which was disheartening. And I have to tell you, we found similar things in other studies um, that just using technology for contact in and of itself cannot substitute necessarily for in-person for people who are alone in old age. But it also mattered who it was with. So from, you know, people who live with others, it's primarily a spouse. The people who lived alone, when they had the phone contact, it was with a friend or a service provider or a neighbor or others. Much more of their contact is with non-family. It's not the close ties. Um, they aren't even having that much contact with their grown children, which you would think they would, like you're a widow that you would be way out here but they're not, their contact is here with people who are not in family as much and they benefit from that in-person contact, friend in particular. The phone contact still was with friends, much more so um, from people who live alone and some with others. And we've been trying to unpack this a little because it's a, it's a counterintuitive um, finding and our hunch is that there's something about it at that time that made people realize what they were missing. And it may even be, I showed you all those benefit of weak ties. And I know um, I almost never go into the store here because we have curbside pickup and they really encourage you to use it. They don't you know, want as many people in the stores, but I, occasionally I run in and I see like the, I, I, I live very near my store. So I know all the checkout people and everyone. It was just so great to see them. And then I, afterwards I'm like, oh, I don't get to do that anymore. So I feel a little, bad about not having my community, if you will. And I suspected some of that feeling is that, oh, I talked to my friend, but I can't see them and I can't do things. So this is something we need to figure out. Um, and hopefully in the long run, we won't have to figure it out as much. But I do think it raises some interesting questions about how people experience even the most familiar technology, um, technologically mediated contact by phone. Okay, so those who were live alone were not more lonely, and they, but they did report less contentment. I don't think I showed you that. They get a boost in positive emotion for both gratitude and contentment when they have in-person contact. And loneliness increased after phone contact. Where does that bring us? Well, we are still looking at things. We did not get all of the closer weak ties, and I'm not sure how we can go about that, but we may attempt to track more to understand better who they actually are encountering um, and, and how they have meaning in their lives. We have photographs of their living rooms and where they're living and we've just um, begun to analyze that to look at how the living space um, interfaces with their activities and such. And as I mentioned, we just barely have begun to look at the ear data and those are really gonna be a big focus of our work for the next, uh, in the next few years. So my take home message is that weak ties get you out in the world. Close ties may help you feel better at home. And we all get by with a little help from our friends and consequential strangers. Um, I have to express gratitude to my collaborators, my grad students, the funding I've received from the National Institute on Aging, the Texas Aging and Longevity Center and CAPS. And I really, really want to thank you for inviting me and letting me just talk with you all and show you what I've been doing. I'm very, very grateful. Well, I guess I'll turn it over to questions. So um, there are a couple of questions that did come in. And first of all, thank you. That was um, that was fantastic and super interesting. And so I already have plenty of questions that, um, that I'm interested in, in asking you during these last uh, several minutes that we have with you. Um, I want to encourage those of you who are listening to use the Q&A if you'd like to type in a question. Uh, another option is to just press the raise hand button and we'll try to keep our um, eyes on that. If you'd like to speak live, uh, we can do that as well if you'd like to just ask the question. But I'll start with the questions that we've, we had come in and it might be useful for you to, um, uh, I was thinking if, if you'd like, you could pull up slides if they seem to be relevant. 
but uh, Neil uh, Charnas um, has a question for you. Um, I, in the introduction, I noted that Neil is, is the current director of the Institute for Successful Longevity here at FSU. Um, he noted in, and I think it was in that picture of the graph where you were showing the different um, places where the activity changes over time, that the, um, the activity seems to be tracking traditional circadian rhythms with drops at 10 a.m. and 2 to 3 p.m., which is um, potentially surprising given that aging trends uh, tend to degrade um, circadian rhythms. And I think just to speak about that. Um, Neil, do you want to do you want to pop in and talk about um, either, you know, your next one's really interesting, too. And I guess I'd I'd love to hear what you were thinking there or with the first one, too. Yeah, if I can. I don't know if I can be heard. You can. Yeah, yes, yeah. I can. Oh, that's good. OK. Yeah, I, it, I was curious. And I'm not sure whether or not that's orthogonal to some of the processes that you were describing with respect to activities. Because obviously, people are biologically driven to some extent by circadian rhythms you know, when they eat, when they sleep, and in particular, these activity burst cycles. And so what I was really curious about is that they appear to be, you appear to be picking them up fairly well with the acta, actograph, uh, um, I guess, plots. And what surprised me, and, and maybe it's worth looking into a little bit, although I think social conventions might get in the way of showing this, is whether or not those are degrading more for the older part of the sample than the younger part of the sample. Because your, your sample has a bit of a range in it. And uh, yeah. I ask that because there's just an awful lot of data suggesting that uh, some of those underlying biological rhythms are pretty disrupted. And uh, you see this a lot with sleep disturbance, for instance, which increases strikingly with increased age, which also has an impact on cognition. And so well, it, it's just an observation that it looks like you're tracking circadian rhythms pretty closely here, even though these are shared activities. So Neil, um, what you're thinking there is that you might find more, you know, I've got five or six days. <laughs> so I might find that the periodicity is more stable if you know, day to day in my 65 to 75 year olds than in my 75 plus. Right. Exactly. Okay. That, that would be really interesting. And, and in that case, I'd want to spaghetti plot it um, where I only showed you one case, but yeah, mm -hmm. that makes a lot of sense. And we do have some people who've been looking at the sleep and, uh, and pain and things like that in our data too, to try to figure some of that out. Um, yeah. But you also had a question about the language use. Did you want to ask that? And yeah. then so the, the other thing that struck me about language use that could be accounting for some of the variability that you were showing is that when do people speak? And people speak usually in a situation when you have, I'll talk about dyads and I'm not sure exactly how this might elaborate out to groups, but you typically communicate with someone um, to help, to enable them to share the same kind of contextual understanding of the situation you're in. So I won't communicate, I might be sitting watching TV with a spouse and I won't say much at all because we both share a fairly well-defined context, what's going on in the show. Maybe make a couple of comments about it and so on. It's, and so with close ties, chances are shared context in the sense of um, kind of a, a shared understanding of the current uh, situation is very high, is typically very high. And it's interesting though, I predict with weak ties, that shared context is gonna be a lot lower. And hence you'd expect more communication just being required. You know, there's a whole bunch of conventions about speech acts. I think Grice is the psycholinguist who, is, who first brought up the, some, of these, some of these notions. That suggest, sort of what are the rules for communication? When do people communicate? And so I think, I think there may be some predictions from those types of psycholinguistic conventions and theories that would make a similar sort of prediction. Strong yeah. ties ought to have much more shared context. Weak ties should have much less shared context. And so I suggested a way to check that would be to look at situations that people are in 
some of which would be highly constrained by context but might be playing a game. Uh -huh. Some of which would be much less constrained by context, like eating lunch together, where there are no well-defined goals or yeah. reasons for, for speech acts, as a way to try to parse out how much of this is sort of is sort of driven by issues about strong or weak ties as uh, stimulating or less stimulating. I'm, I'm not quite sure what the what the what the underlying theory is here. Uh, versus the uh, necessities of conversation. When do people communicate, or what are the things that that kind of drive people to communicate more generally? So I think there are ways you could kind of address that if you could categorize better categorize the situations that people fall into. No, you're absolutely, I mean, your first part was exactly our prediction that particularly yeah. by late life, the people you're close to, you almost have things in code where you can yeah. say, oh, you remember that time in Montreal? Oh yeah. And the whole story fills itself in. And so, um, so yes, there's a lot less need because of all the shared meaning and codes that have built up. And you're right. I mean, some of the question is, okay, would you still do it in the exact same situation? We give you a, a jigsaw puzzle with your spouse and a jigsaw puzzle with your coffee barista or whoever to do. Um, and yet I think one of the things, again, in our follow-up studies that we, we could do something experimental like that, which would be important. But I'd also like to disentangle a little more that maybe it's that you almost always are solving certain kinds of puzzles with weak ties and other kinds with close ties. So I mean, I think I think that's part of it is sort of that daily embeddedness. But I think you've absolutely nailed it. And I, I would like to know more about the context. And I should figure that out. It's a great idea. Um, Thank you for the explanation. Yeah. So um, we have uh, four more questions that have come in. Uh, I don't know if you want to um, answer those questions uh, in order. Um, I can. I, I, we can start with uh, Tyler's question. Do you, I'll go ahead and read that. To what extent do you, um, would you extrapolate these findings to people in different life stages? Um, does last week tie interaction mean more screen time for anybody? Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, one of the things I, I kind of um, I kind of skirted the issue is that you know the weak ties and the screen time are pretty highly embedded in younger cohorts. So you know, my kids are teenagers have done great during the pandemic because they're on Zoom and Netflix party and uh, party room. I don't know what all, but they've got an entire active social life that is both screen time and social. And so um, that's not quite so much the same in late life where even for those who are getting more involved with social media, it's typically ties that also have uh, in person. It, it's to maintain that tie with your grandchild as opposed to as much of forming all these new social media. So I think the, the idea of the screen and what is a weak tie is much more complicated with younger people. And it's really complicated right now with COVID. So I think we're gonna have to wait three years and figure that out together. But yeah, it's different, not just because of life stage, but because of uh, cohort, just generational differences, if you will. Um, Miles has a question for you. Um, she said, she's curious about your thoughts on how COVID may have long-term impacts on the way older adults might lose, um, actively add or, or value these weaker ties or consequential, consequential strangers in the coming years. Hmm. Okay. I, I don't know the answer to that. I think, I think the COVID thing, one of the most interesting things about this phenomenon is one that it's probably the most widely studied social phenomenon of all human experience, because everyone I know was, in, you know, running a study right now, but on the other hand, it's changed so rapidly. So what seemed like, yeah, we've all been shut in for eight months and it feels like just yesterday that Don and I were talking about whether I was going to make it to Florida or not. But on the other hand, when I look at what we found in May and June, the situation keeps changing. And so I'm not sure that that what's going on right now, you can say this is going to be permanent and this isn't. <clears throat> the one thing that I do think will endure is um, telehealth. And that's going to expand not necessarily just weak ties, but differences to resources and things like that. I do think the telehealth expansion is really going to stay. But how all the Zoom and other technology things and I just don't know the answer. I, I really don't. I think I think everything's still in flux. So stay tuned, keep watching, keep studying, and you know, and I guess we'll see how it pans out. Well, if it's okay, we're we're just a couple minutes over, but we'll try to get through the last two questions. Okay. Um, is that okay with you? 
Oh, I'm, I'm fine. I don't want to keep all of you. Great. If you need to go get a snack or something, I don't know. <laughs> uh, let's try, we'll, we'll see if we can do these last two. Um, uh, Larry asked, uh, this might not be related to your specific research, but what do you know about research on the extent to which weak ties, which I'm convinced are very important to quality of life in later years, growing, shrinking, or staying the same? Well, it depends on how you look at this question. So I'm, I've mentioned a couple times, there's a psychologist named Laura Karstensen, and she developed this theory, socio-emotional selectivity theory. And it is really a dominant paradigm. There are hundreds, maybe thousands of studies that have used her theory. And the basic idea behind the theory is that as you grow older and you approach endings, if you will, whether it's end of life, graduation, you're going to move, you want to spend your remaining time with the people you feel closest to and who give you the most emotional reward. That theory is very well researched and it, a lot of studies validate it and support it. That theory doesn't address your question, which is, well, what about all the weak ties? What do people do with weak ties? Um, yes, weak ties are involved in specific activities. They both arise from them and lead to them. So you develop weak ties from going to that yoga class or from going to the store at the same time of day or from joining a book club or from you know just being in a certain place at a certain time you develop uh, patterns of weak ties. So those do arise from activities and they lead to activities. One of your weak ties says, hey, you know, do you wanna go for a walk or with the rest of us? Um, there is a pattern in the types of behaviors in that they tend to be more, like two categories, either they are leisure and chosen, so you don't brush your teeth with your weak tie acquaintance, um, you know, they tend to either be that or to be highly um, subscribed, like you need to see the doctor. Um, gender differences, um, that's another interesting question. And what's interesting there is in late life, um, we were just looking at some data showing that the men still do have, it's not as large a difference as you find in close ties, because especially in these cohorts, the men establish these connections through work. So if you ask them about their close ties, they still have fewer. But if you were to track who they actually interact with over time, they're still interacting depending on their health status and things with people in the broader world. But women, women still always do better on anything where you want to count social ties. Um, so let's see. So Michael asked, um, have you looked at what is leading older adults to specific behaviors? Are older adults seeking out specific activities? Um, uh, are close ties bringing them into activities? Uh, anything on that nature? Patterns between the behaviors? That's a really, really great question, and I haven't looked at it closely enough. So I just don't know. Did your grown child come over and get you on the internet so that you could join next door where there's a whole group in your neighborhood that loves to look at owls? And, you know, but it was only because your kid did that for you. I don't know. It makes sense to me when I say that, that probably that is how you got on the owl watching neighborhood, whatever, but it'd be a really good thing to look at. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, Neil was curious if you, are there any gender differences that you've observed in any of these weak ties? Other than, you just happened to have mentioned that. Men yeah, no, have, I saw Neil's question, uh, so I, I did. Oh, okay, I, I just, okay, that. good. Yeah. yeah, great. All right. Well, um, I think that's that's all of our, our questions here. I just want to thank you personally. You know, such a, a fantastic talk and such a pleasure to have the chance to to hear about your work. And um, it was just really enjoyable. And I'm very appreciative for the time you spent. And um, yeah, and and all the great questions that we had. So I think we'll bring it to a close. But um, hopefully, someday in the future, we can have you here in real life. And um, and uh, have the chance to, you know, go get that cup of coffee with, uh, you know, the favorite barista and, <laughs> and uh, talk about all of this. So thank you so much. And uh, I'll just point, point out too that this will be posted on the website. I hope that you saw in the chat. If you're interested in seeing um, this video, it'll be posted on the, um, the uh, COSP uh, YouTube page. So I, if, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's uh, look in the chat function and you can find that link. Thank you again so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. Yeah, thank you.